Welcome everyone to the Wednesday seminar here at Geoscience Australia. My name's Lisa Carson. I'm the branch head of community safety. I just like to, it's good to see people in the theatre. We're in the theatre today and there's probably quite a lot online. So before we get started, I'd like to begin with uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today. Pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. So this morning's seminar is the Global Earthquake Model, Achievements, Future Directions, and the presenter, no stranger to us, but it's good to see you, John Snyder. So John is the Secretary General of GEM, Global Earthquake Model Foundation. He is a geophysicist with more than 40 years experience in earthquake hazard research, natural hazard risk modeling. He received his PhD in the University of Wisconsin and did his postdoctoral studies at Carnegie Institute of Science. He then worked for the Electric Power Research Institute on earthquake hazard mythologies for uh, application to nuclear power plant safety and later as chief scientist and Aeon impact forecasting in developing hazard models for catastrophic financing applications. So, John moved to Australia in 2000, where he headed up the development of the multi-hazard risk modelling capability for, GS, for Australia government here at GA for the application of capacity building, disaster risk management and risk reduction in Australia, Southwest Pacific and Southeast Asia. And now John moved to Italy in 2016 to take up his current role as Secretary General of GEM. So, Today's talk on the Global Earthquake uh, Foundation um, on the future and where we're going. So I'll hand it over to you, John. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, greetings to all. Um, great to have a, a live audience out here. I have, um, we have, I think, 10, 10 people. That's the largest audience I've spoken to in the last two years. <laughs> So uh, it's interesting times. Um, so I would uh, uh, thank you, Lisa, for the, for the very nice introduction. It is indeed great to be back here at, at Geoscience Australia. Many fond memories here uh, and uh, very good to see uh, my good friends uh, in the audience. So a uh, bit of an overview, uh, what we're going to talk about today. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to GEM. I know many of you um, may be uh, familiar with it, but I think uh, also others perhaps not so much. I'll give a, sum a summary of what GEM has been up to uh, since its inception in 2009, a little bit about how uh, we've been collaborating with Geoscience Australia, and then a, a peek into the future out to uh, 2030. So with this sort of presentation, it's, um, it's, it's always kind of uh, obligatory to, to, to start with a slide that says, you know, why, why are we um, you know, developing models? Why are we so interested in understanding risk? The truth is uh, the risk has been increasing over time. Uh, the insurance industry in particular, reinsurance industry became very concerned about this um, in the last uh, decade or so, <clears throat> earthquake risk was increasing, uh, natural hazard risk in general was increasing, uh, insured losses were increasing, and uh, the old methods of statistical analysis of past events was simply not good enough to get a handle on where, you know, what future losses might be. So catastrophe modeling became quite prominent um, I'd say around the turn of the century and a little bit before. Um, so Jem in uh, 2004, there was a, a, um, a meeting of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, which concluded that uh, earthquake risk was something that could be uh, uh, studied basically through a collaborative effort, a global effort, so a partnership was built and the foundation was formed in Pavia, Italy. Um, and with a vision to develop a world, to have a world resilient to earthquakes. That was the overall vision. 
The mission was to become the world's official, most complete source of earthquake risk resources, and hence a globally accepted standard for risk assessment. The partnership uh, looks like this today. It's, uh, there, there are a number of elements to it. First, the public governors, of which Geoscience Australia is one, a uh, number of, of uh, governments, national governments around the world, our, our uh, governors have a vote on the governing board. Um, these are often geoscience organizations like GA, but also ministries of science and, uh, and also civil protection. Private governors are mainly insurance and reinsurance companies. Advisors, um, also sponsors, there are a number of companies, engineering companies, um, also insurance and, and risk modeling companies. Associates are organizations that we work with, usually international organizations who, who advise us. Um, they don't pay dues, but they, they collaborate and they bring, uh, bring partnerships uh, in sharing data uh, and advice. And then we have some project partners and, and uh, product partners that work with us to uh, develop particular uh, uh, products or, or uh, through projects and to help disseminate information to the broader public. So um, components of risk, uh, the old risk triangle, I, I bring this out for those who, who aren't familiar with how risk uh, modeling, risk assessment uh, works. The basic components of risk are the hazard, that's the underlying, in this case, natural hazard, an earthquake, could be a flood or fire or windstorm as well. Uh, exposure is essentially the buildings, the people, the environment, uh, those elements at risk. And the vulnerability is essentially the relationship between those two. So the potential for damage, death or injury. So I'll bring this slide, this, um, these elements will come back in, in future uh, slides. So what does GEM do? GEM uh, develops, we develop software, we um, develop information that uh, uh, to try to standardize uh, data, data sets, data formats for uh, ease of transferring and exchanging information. We conduct hazard and risk assessments. We work very closely with our partners, with uh, universities as well, with a wide range of organizations to develop capacity. So the software is free. We give trainings. We uh, we work uh, with with many organizations to um, to help them improve their their capability, both to it to to develop hazard and risk models, but also to use them uh, for decision making. Um, so there's public outreach and technical assistance as well. So this is this is a uh, kind of an overview of how the gem ecosystem works in the GEM disaster risk reduction space. So we have um, from the left-hand side, first we have, we have the, is this uh, mouse? Doesn't seem to. Okay, from the left-hand side, we have the global drivers. Um, we have the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, the Sustainability Development Goals, uh, the Paris Accord on Climate Change. These are big uh, drivers, uh, all, all the, um, developed in uh, 2015 and, and still uh, uh, working today, which kind of provide the, the uh, global context within which we do our work. We have our, our uh, founding <coughs> principles, collaboration, openness, public good, and scientific credibility. These are really kind of our, our um, you know, our, our underlying, um, uh, well, goals, principles, principles, I would say, that, that guide how we work and, and how we, um, uh, how we uh, develop our, our uh, projects and programs. So within the big circle, you've got the secretariat, which is about 30 people, mainly based in Pavia, although in the day, this uh, day of the pandemic, uh, that group is fairly well dispersed around the planet. Um, the, uh, we report to a governing board, and I presented to you the, 
um, the, um, the members of that board. We then have project partners and we have a broader collaboration network for uh, which not only do we provide information to them, but it's very important that they're also providing data and information uh, much as Geoscience Australia does, provides data and models to, to GEM, which we then in turn um, share with, with others. So this provides the basis for developing products, for, um, for, um, for providing those in turn to users, for those to go to stakeholders and so forth. So at the end of the day, downstream, we hope to have then a um, safer communities um, reduce the economic loss and eventually a, a resilient world. That's the, that's the ambition. So what have we been doing the last um, 12 years? Very uh, key to our program is, the, is Open Quake. Open Quake is not only a piece of software, but it's actually a, a system of, of, of software and, and tools and so forth that um, that allow a user to not only um, not only run a, a, a risk model, but also to develop it. So Geoscience Australia, for instance, is very active in using these tools to, to develop their national uh, earthquake hazard and, and risk models. And uh, so where we work um, broadly across the planet, um, a range of collabor uh, collaborators in, in countries on um, uh, throughout the world and, and a number of sites where we've conducted workshops and trainings and so forth. So work, by working worldwide to share knowledge and data and best practices, we help to build capacity and bring together uh, international and local experts to, um, to work on earthquake hazard and risk issues. Examples of capacity training. Uh, and in the last, since the pandemic started, so in the last two years, we've uh, moved a lot of the, um, the uh, training with OpenQuake to, to an online um, process. And in that period, we've had something like, uh, well, over 400 people trained uh, in 56 countries and 140 cities. Um, so, by one of the advantages of the pandemic has been, I think everyone would agree that the ability to actually reach to a, to a broad, broader range of, of people. So that has actually been quite a success. Um, so, a, a, a brief summary of what we've done, you might say the big achievements over the last, the last dozen years. So in the first five years, we were focused on developing the tools, on um, essentially developing the collaboration network and uh, uh, building an integrated global view of earthquake risk. That was the kind of foundation uh, component. In the, in the following five years, we actually then developed um, a global earthquake hazard and risk map um, founded on the underlying models. Uh, and in the, in the uh, subsequent uh, years since then, we've celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the uh, OpenQuake engine. Uh, we've done a lot of work to enhance the performance of the engine. We've improved models. Um, we've done a lot of, of uh, new projects uh, working with partners. Um, and most recently, we received an award for the, uh, the uh, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute's best uh, paper for global risk for, for, 19, for, sorry, for 2020. And um, this was, I think, quite a great um, achievement for, for GEM, recognizing that, that GEM has actually uh, made, a, made a significant impact on the development of um, information on earthquake risk globally. Um, and I'll go, th let, let me go to the next. So I'll go back to a few examples of, um, of what we've been doing over those years. I'll start with hazard. 
and then we'll go to exposure and vulnerability just to give you a taste. So in the in the hazard uh, modeling framework, uh, this again we don't just have software; we also have um, we develop uh, we develop this framework using uh, a wide range of data sets. Those uh, and a number of tools that allow us to combine that information into a um, into models. Those models are shared uh, are are developed. Uh, with our with our partners as well, um, so that has resulted in a our being able to develop a mosaic or compiled set of global, uh, national and regional models into a global um, set of seismic hazard models, and then there there are, there are tools for uh, testing these models and assuring that the results are are, are the best possible. So that's the framework. Um, the actual components of the model, uh, as, as most of you would know, um, recordings of past earthquakes, uh, information on active faults, uh, tectonics, that is the movement of those faults and the uh, tectonic plates, and, and of course, uh, ground motion recordings from past earthquakes. All of that information goes into developing an earthquake hazard model, which whose purpose is to try to forecast future events and future ground shaking. But there are different ways of combining that information. Um, so we had a choice. Uh, we could have developed one global model that it, well, one global model by a single organization. So we could have just gathered all the information, built our own model and said, here you go, guys, this is the best model that anyone can make. Uh, or we could have, or we, the other approach is to, is to reach out to our uh, neighbors, our collaborators, organizations like GA and, and, uh, and bring their models or your models into the, into the global picture and create a combination of regional and national models, uh, which, we, which we call the mosaic. So the, the, uh, we decided to do the mosaic approach. Now the, the negatives of that are that you don't necessarily get a homogeneous consistent model. Uh, it also requires extensive con consultation, time and energy and so forth to work with hundreds of people to try to bring them all together. It's definitely the harder approach. It's the much more time consuming approach. But the advantage is that you um, you get everybody's you get you get input from hundreds of people. You include local expertise and community participation. You promote trust in those models, and their and ultimately their usage for risk reduction activities. So people are using their own models. They've been vetted. They've been compared. They have a, you might say, a stamp of um, approval and recognition that that um, everybody's using best practice, and uh, you then have a mechanism for assessing the uh, state of the art globally, and and having a a you might say a self-sustaining method for the improvement of those models over time, together with the tools and so forth that that uh, we also provide to help uh, build and maintain them. So that's that's the that's the approach we've taken, and and we think that's uh, been the best way to go. Um, so, but to do that again uh, requires a lot of collaboration. So, here are identified a number of um, of models, and uh, uh, together with the organizations that that we need to we needed to bring together to. Um, to create this mosaic. So you see the Australian model there uh, from 2018. Uh, New Zealand at that time was a 2010 model. They're now, they're now completing a new one uh, and so forth. Um, and you know, more models here. There were, some, there were many places where we didn't have collaborators. We didn't have 
models uh, that that we that we were either working with other organizations to develop. Um, so there were cases where we simply had to build them ourselves or adopt uh, models from the literature. So, for example, Russia, uh, North Africa, uh, Central America. We did not have um, at the time we didn't at the time we developed the first model. We didn't have uh, partners there. We since developed a collaboration with you with the uh, U.S. aid funding for a Central America project. Um, we adopted a model from China. Uh, it, they they allowed us to take their model and uh, and um, take all the ingredients and build a model using OpenQuake. So we had all the information from their model, but they did not allow us to share the uh, the details of that model. We could share the results, but not the the inner workings. Um, so it goes. You do what you can. Um, but the ultimate result then was this global seismic hazard map. So it's ground shaking uh, potential, probability of exceedance of 10% in 50 years. This is basically the standard that's used um, uh, worldwide for, for building code application. Um, and the and nominally this is for rock, so you you can see where the uh, the um, the yellow and and uh, and uh, reddish tones are where the highest hazard are, where the the greatest potential for ground shaking. Okay, so exposure, what happens there? So to build an exposure model, um, we start basically at the national level, and and build up from there. So uh, this for Italy, for example, this is a list of the, the data sets, the information that we collected in order to um, define uh, population and, and essentially building um, exposure attributes. So you have the housing census, obviously. Um, you have information on commercial establishments, socioeconomic data. Uh, and so forth. Uh, building surveys at the more detailed level, um, information on replacement costs, because you need to know if if you're going to, um, if, a, if, if a building's going to be damaged in an earthquake, then we need to know roughly what the, um, the costs of, of uh, rebuilding or replacing it might be. We then, we use satellite data, for instance, to, to then uh, focus in on to to uh, aggregate information to a much more um, uh, specific detail because the the information we have from census for instance is aggregated at a at a state or, or province level but by using satellite information from nighttime lights for instance you can then you can then uh, determine where the the um, you might say the hot spots um, really are Okay, um, and for instance, in uh, in uh, the sub-Saharan Africa region, uh, we developed we developed a residential building stock database. There, it's not as detailed as it would be for Italy or for Australia, but it's you know it was a first cut at um, at, at pulling together. Um, information on buildings and as you might expect in that part of the world the building types are a little bit different than you might find in other parts of the world um, but um, and of course modeling them is somewhat problematic but there are indeed similarities uh, adobe buildings are fairly similar worldwide for instance um, so this led to the development of a the GEM building taxonomy, which um, is actually designed for all hazards. So it has information, uh, for instance, on roof types, which can be used for assessing um, or defining building types for, for, uh, for instance, for wind um, hazard or for, sorry, for wind risk. So you see their information on, on wall type, on structural irregularity, on uh, occupancy, 
height, age, et cetera. Um, so this is the taxonomy. It is not, uh, we don't have complete information uh, around the world for all of this, but, but this is also um, a, um, a taxonomy that, that is uh, being used by a number of other organizations so that, um, and it's, it was actually fund, the, uh, the taxonomy itself was funded by, uh, by World Bank and it's being promoted as a, um, as a um, taxonomy for, for use by, um, in an all hazard uh, context. And so then this is an example of what the earthquake exposure um, looks like for Southeast Asia. It's a bit faint, but what you can see here is um, essentially numbers of buildings that are fairly fine uh, detail across that region. Okay, so vulnerability. Uh, in vulnerability modeling, um, basically we want to understand what the uh, the damage state of a building might be after an event. So you have you can have extensive damage, slight damage, collapse, or or no damage. And each of those uh, each of those states can be modeled um, by uh, either through empirical well, it can either be empirical data on on uh, historic events or or through uh, computer simulation. You can come up with curves which describe the probability of, of a building being in one of those states um, uh, after an event, depending on the level of ground shaking that, that it experiences. So that's the, the foundation of vulner, vulnerability modeling of buildings. So we, we then created a database. Um, at the time in 2018, I think it had over 16, over 600 uh, building uh, vulnerability functions. It's since been improved substantially. Uh, a lot of the functions that were available from the literature, for instance, we found had, had not been uh, validated. They were nice models, but they didn't necessarily work uh, in terms of comparing uh, losses from historic events. So there's been a lot of work to, to calibrate the models against uh, real data. And all of those models, uh, those 600 models or so are, um, or curves are actually available for free. They can be downloaded from our website. Uh, together with, um, with guidelines for fragility and vulnerability uh, derivation. So how do we go about doing it? So again, this is an effort to standardize the process and, and uh, raise the level of um, of the of the of the of the models and data that are that are out there for everyone to use. Okay, so risk. Uh, as with hazard, doing putting together the risk, most countries don't have risk earthquake risk models. Many many countries have hazard models, but very few have have actually at a national level developed publicly available risk models. Most of the risk models are. Um, are in the private domain. They're developed by risk modeling companies for commercial uh, insurance and so forth. So what we want to have is a publicly available uh, set of risk models that can be used as a baseline for comparison to, to, other, uh, to other models um, and, and, uh, and, and, and are transparent. So through collaboration with, with uh, many organizations, uh, who were uh, either provided project funds or provided data. Uh, we, uh, we built the uh, risk model um, primarily from uh, putting together all the data that, that I described and the methods uh, I described previously. Uh, okay, so this is the global seismic risk map that resulted in 2018. It shows average annual loss. So it's the, if you took all of the, uh, say, losses from earthquakes over a thousand years, say, and you divided that through by the number of years, you get an average annual loss. So you don't get losses every year, but you can get an average you might expect. So it's an average annual loss um, for uh, the cost of, of, um, of essentially replacing or rebuilding buildings. 
and it's normalized for the cost of the local cost of repairing or building buildings, not not the absolute cost. So it's it's a risk map which represents um, essentially the um, represents the, the 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 you might say the local cost of um, of 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 restoring buildings, not a uh, not an absolute I'd say U.S. dollar terms. Because it's obviously cheaper to rebuild a building in in uh, say Nepal than it is in San Francisco, for instance. Anyway, you could see where most of the the risk uh, is um, throughout Asia, uh, Southern Europe, uh, Western South America, uh, Central America, um, Western U.S., and so forth, and a little bit in Australia, but it's a bit hard to see at this scale. <laughs> New Zealand. New Zealand, of course, right. And beneath uh, beneath this map for, um, I don't think we did all 195 countries, but about 180, there's an earthquake risk profile at the national level. So you have in that social indicators, uh, risk indicators, uh, and, uh, and what we call an, in an integrated risk map also includes some of the, uh, the social factors that would, um, that would impede or or um, help the the recovery process from an event. I'm not going to go into detail on that aspect, but, but it's an important part of assessing risk and and understanding the um, the, the overall risk in a holistic way. Okay, so what about GA and GEM? Um, so GA helped. Uh, quite a lot with building that global hazard model um, by provide, well, providing uh, tremendous assistance to the in Indonesian government, firstly, so they could build their own earthquake hazard model. Um, and uh, that over a number of years led to the, their, their um, first model that they genuinely built uh, through their own resources. Um, also, Papua New Guinea, um, that was with the help of, of, um, of Geoscience Australia, the Australian model, of course. And I, I'd like to specifically thank um, uh, Phil Cummins, Trevor Allen, Hadi Gassemi, Trevor Dew, David Robinson, Martin Hazelwood, many of you of whom are actually here for, for assistance uh, on those models. And um, and then in the vulnerability uh, exposure and risk domain, uh, primarily Mark Edwards and, and Maruf uh, Rahman, who are also here. Um, and I'm, undoubtedly, I've forgotten some people. But um, there is also here a, a quote from Phil Cummins, whom we interviewed. Um, we asked him, what do you think about GEM? And he said, uh, when GEM came along, there was an organization. Uh, they were an organization that provided excellent tools and software. Etc. We were able then to improve greatly the information that went into earthquake hazard assessment without having to spend lots of time just developing the software. So this is a really key thing, I think, for organizations like this and, and many others. Um, by being part of a, of a global system, um, you're leveraging the resources, you're leveraging the capability and, and getting a return on, on that investment. Um, and here's uh, Mark and uh, Maruf and I and um, Steve, I can't remember Steve's, Steve Wright uh, at, in uh, Western Australia when we um, were launching the Ramsey project, looking at infrastructure in Western Australia. So this is, uh, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a significant project. Uh, and we're hoping uh, to continue that now with the Eropsi project, and I'll ask I, I'll ask Mark to tell me what the acronym actually is. But um, that project will be looking at at um, the systemic risk of in, of um, the infrastructure uh, again in Western Australia, going out to uh, Meriden. So the, these kinds of projects and projects that are done with others. Um, uh, other other organizations are very much uh, a key part of the uh, GEM story. 
um, and there are other elements that that GA is doing that we would like very much like to incorporate into the gem um, into the gem work as well. The population modeling, for instance. Okay, so in the future, what role will we play? Um, there are a number of operational uh, considerations for for how we move forward to 2030. Um, our principles, which I described, how we're structured, uh, what expertise we have, um, just generally how we how how we're presently operating. The strategic considerations are around uh, what the needs of the sponsors are, the global drivers and how they're evolving. And importantly, for instance, the role of climate change, um, because this is an area that is really driving the investment in, in risk reduction. Earthquake just doesn't cut it. <laughs> it's, it's sort of the afterthought when someone says, oh, we want to build a risk. We want to protect a community from natural disasters climate, the climate change uh, bucket uh, tends to have the funding, the earthquake comes in, um, you know, as a, as a, um, as a second, second effort. So we, and we feel that a lot of our work is actually very directly re relevant to climate change risk assessment. The exposure and vulnerability modeling in particular are fundamental um, for better understanding climate risk. Uh, and then there's partnerships in the uh, with a number of international initiatives that are uh, important part of this. So we asked our sponsors what uh, you know what their interests were, uh, and we we had defined three areas of gem work over the years. We had a core capability, which is developing the models and the tools and the, the sort of fundamentals uh, for earthquake hazard and risk assessment, uh, new science, which is, which is looking, you know, has always been looking uh, to the future and things like multi-hazard risk assessment, systemic risk, uh, better information on earthquakes, such as clustering and aftershocks, force shocks, uh, what we call secondary perils, such as tsunami, liquefaction, and landslide triggered by, by earthquakes. Uh, as well as resilience indicators. So really right at the, at the um, urban level, uh, community level, better understanding how we can take earthquake information, the hazard and risk, and build that into information that can be used at community level. So these are the things that are starting to become uh, in demand by, uh, by, our, by our sponsors and other collaborators. And then we've been working quite a bit on applications such as urban risk assessment um, and, and uh, more detailed um, uh, projects, which again are leveraging the basic tools that we develop and bringing them down to community level. So um, I present this diagram. So a riskier future. Uh, as I mentioned, so we have, we, we, we now recognize that, that the hazard, the exposure and the vulnerability are not stationary. They're, they're, they're potentially uh, increasing in time. For earthquake, okay, the hazard for earthquake may not be changing, um, but it certainly is for other, other hazards. And uh, again, the exposure and the vulnerability information um, is fundamental to better understanding that risk. So we're working very much to collaborate with organizations that do flood modeling, that do wind um, uh, or, or tropical cyclone risk assessment and providing uh, that those fundamental data, data layers uh, for them. Uh, we're, also, we're also looking um, and have done some pilot work on, on, on uh, modeling that exposure and vulnerability into the future. So this is an example of, of uh, how the exposure or say population uh, in this particular area, I'm not sure where it is, um, has, has grown over the last uh, 40 years say, um, and using 
um, machine learning and and, and uh, combined with with local data with with intelligence on um, the geography on urban planning etc one can start to really model what the future exposure will look like and it's critically important for understanding um, uh, climate risk obviously um, so here's an example of the evol evolution of average annual losses for Costa Rica uh, going out to 2050 for this is for earthquake uh, so this is this is not evolving hazard. This is simply the in, the, the expected increase in in population and uh, and and buildings uh, over this time period. And uh, other things that one could start to do. Another example from South America, where we looked at the uh, uh, what what if you understood the risk. And you understood, you understand the building types and so forth, and you could project this to the future. You can start to to really understand what the cost benefit would be of reducing that risk over time. Uh, we have we have an example here of uh, of a capability for earthquake hazard modeling that is really the future of modeling. So we're looking at how active faults. Uh, not only evolve, but how they are um, by 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 bringing together uh, geodetic information uh, and and uh, information from mapping fa faults on the ground. We can start to see how um, we can get a better integrated view of of the uh, of the hazard. Now, moving to the more local level, um, from a project called the Training and Communication for Earthquake Risk Assessment. Um, which is an, uh, a project funded by U.S. Aid. Here we're looking at at uh, city risk profiles for uh, three different cities in Latin America. This particular one is for Cali, Colombia, and you can see in this case that we have a number of, of risk metrics. Um, starting from the left, we have displaced persons. We have um, we have the capital um, assets. We have information on mortality, on um, casualties, and on uh, collapsed, uh, collapsed structures. So when you combine, when you put this together uh, across uh, an urban landscape, you have um, the potential to provide uh, very discrete information about potential risk. At the bottom, that's characterized, this information is characterized by building type. So we can very immediately see where the most at-risk structures are and where the most um, vulnerable populations uh, would be. Moving to a, to a, a global risk context, uh, many of you may remember the global assessment reports that were uh, produced by the uh, UN uh, DRR. Uh, the last one, I believe, was in 2017. Um, in this new approach, the Global Risk Index Initiative, the idea is to uh, bring much more information together um, about, firstly, about buildings and infrastructure and population, but also much more detailed information about um, uh, social uh, and socioeconomic information. Also include modeling of uh, downstream effects or cascading effects of events. So, you see to the left a number of uh, hazards that are of interest. Uh, you have uh, then exposure and vulnerability and, and a number of direct and indirect impacts that uh, we aim to model through this uh, collaboration. At the bottom of the screen, you see a number of organizations, including GEM, that are working together to uh, develop uh, these risk metrics. So, what uh, uh, GEM has done um, in uh, revising its strategic plan for the for the next decade um, is to is to take a look at these uh, opportunities, uh, the space where the demand is going over the next uh, the next decade. And what you have here is the vision that we uh, established in 2009, a world that is resilient to earthquakes and a mission to become the world's official, most complete source of earthquake risk resources and a globally accepted standard for risk assessment. So our, our new uh, vision 
is to include other natural hazards, so earthquakes and other natural hazards, and to do this through a um, through global partnerships uh, to continue to be a complete source of earthquake risk resources, to ensure that GEM products find application in in a broader catastrophe risk uh, management context worldwide, and that we become uh, a global leader in integrated multi-hazard risk assessment and resilience planning. So we're we're broadening the scope to work with other um, organizations and collaborators on other hazards, to work in a, a more um, more uh, seamlessly in the multi-hazard risk context, and to extend our risk metrics from what we're doing now, which is primarily in the area of. Um, of estimating losses and impacts from events to, to looking at uh, downstream effects that can be of more value for um, resilience planning. And this concept is, is captured in this diagram, which uh, shows the relationship between data and models versus providers and users. And the idea is that um, over time, say the last 30, 40 years, we've evolved from uh, having the technology to, uh, to focus primarily on, um, on uh, information about disaster events, uh, provide, to provide warnings, to provide uh, locations of uh, earthquakes, for instance, uh, and to provide fairly crude estimates of impact. But now we're, we're very much modeling the probabilistic, in a probabilistic context, so we're, we're um, sampling all of the possible scenarios that could happen over time um, as we move into the middle of the of the uh, diagram, uh, uh, the middle left column, and moving up over time to be able to uh, include cascading and uh, risk and and systemic uh, attributes of risk, uh, and finally into uh, what we would call integrated risk um, and resilience uh, measurements. So in turn, then the 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 um, the providers have have shifted from uh, the fundamental researcher, um, uh, perhaps uh, working in a government institution, through to um, what we now have hazard and risk modelers. We have uh, and we have an integration of private and public interests uh, moving towards our ability to bring all of this information into a, into a, you might say, a resilience planning context. So um, over time then, uh, spanning, uh, say from when I started my, my professional career back in 1980, we're moving, we're moving up to um, the upper right, uh, whereby we hope that by 2030, we're actually operating much more in the upper right-hand corner. So uh, GEM, as it, as it exists now, uh, primarily operates in the middle uh, where we're providing uh, earthquake hazard and risk modeling. We're providing information um, for uh, building codes uh, for hazard, and we're also providing information to insurance companies about risk transfer and uh, for um, disaster mitigation. So if we take those last three uh, boxes, the upper, um, the sort of greenish boxes, the last the, in the upper right-hand corner. And we, starting left to right now, our, our, our vision, our mission then, uh, and, and objectives over the next number of years is to incorporate um, um, uh, activities and outputs that address uh, these, these uh, three areas. So in the probabilistic risk and secondary hazards, we have uh, we have earthquake um, secondary hazards like landslide, liquefaction, fire, post loss, amplification, et cetera. Uh, we have advanced earthquake modeling, uh, looking at future exposure and vulnerability, um, and um, further looking at at um, developing a home a, a homogenized global hazard and risk model where we bring together the information uh, that we presently have in more of a mosaic or, or um, combined form or collective form 
into a, into a much more integrated process. And then in the second column with multi-hazard uh, and systemic risk, uh, we, we hope to be looking then more uh, in depth at cascading risk of infrastructure. How, so how uh, damage to buildings and infrastructure then affects um, the um, uh, downstream uh, function of society. Um, look at e exposure for all hazards. So we're looking in a multi-hazard context. And in the right-hand column, it's, it's bringing in more uh, resilience indicators, more, more sophisticated risk uh, and more articulated risk metrics and better indicators for um, so essentially uh, planning and, 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 um, and developing resilience uh, in partnership with communities. So in uh, the present year, in 2022, Jim, uh, is proposing to well we're actually part way through the to the year so we're actually in the process of doing this um, we're looking to improve our global risk model for a number of areas particularly the middle east and australia uh, we're looking to employ a new approach for vulnerability modeling um, and uh, and to improve our methods for estimating economic and human losses um, and uh, we are looking to redesign and uh, generate a, a, a new suite of country risk profiles so they'll have more information. They'll be uh, on the order of 190 profiles for the countries in the world and, uh, and they'll have uh, a richer array of information. So, and then at the end of this year, we plan to then release the, the second major release of our global hazard and risk maps and models. So uh, watch for that coming in December of this year. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak to you. Jim looks forward to continuing its collaboration with Geoscience Australia. Uh, we began this journey back in 2010 and, uh, and it's been a great collaboration in, in those years. So thanks very much for your support and your strong scientific leadership, not only uh, within GA and Australia, but literally um, leadership uh, globally in, in, uh, in developing uh, state-of-the-art earthquake hazard and risk models uh, and for your uh, sharing of that information with us. So it's all about open and transparent collaboration, credible science, and public good. So thank you very much again for um, coming to listen to me today. Thank you.